Okay, we are going to get started today because we've got several on line from our alumni community that are joining us today. So we want to be uh, cognizant of their schedules as well. But as the last few people are grabbing pizza, welcome everybody. This is a, a wonderful presentation today. I'm looking forward to um, all that our recipient has to say. But welcome students, faculty, and friends to our McDermott Medal presentation. All students, we will be passing around the iPads. Make sure that you sign in, uh, that you were here, and use your student ID with the preceding zeros so that we have that done. If you have any questions, you can ask. They'll be at the end of the row. But uh, most of you, that's, you've done that several times. But if, if you're here for the first time we, and a student, we definitely want you to sign in. So, uh, But once again, welcome, everyone. A special welcome to our alumni community online. Uh, also welcome our speaker's family, uh, wife Jessica, 86 graduate, somewhere out there. there. <laughs> uh, son Ben, uh, who is could be a future tiger. Uh, we're working on it today while he's here. Uh, son Jack, who flew in last night and surprised his family. So we're very happy to have the ho our presenter's family today with us. Also, uh, I call him, I think everyone else does, legendary Paige Cotton is here. Where did he end up? There he is, uh, at, former athletic director and head soccer coach, who uh, also gives high credentials to our speaker today and said he knew it all along, even when he was here at school. He knew that uh, he was going to be successful, and so it's wonderful to have Paige here today as well. Um, and welcome again, as I said, to all our alumni and friends virtually. Uh, we will try to have a short Q&A session, so if you do have a question, uh, hold it. We may or may not. We've got a lot to accomplish before some of you have to go back to class, so um, but potentially there'll be a Q&A session at the end, so if you do have a question, please. And I will be speaking a little more about the McDermott Medal, and Dr. White, President Dr. White, will be uh, also a part of that uh, presentation after we have our speaker. But for now, I would like to introduce to you our, our um, presenter, who's going to present the speaker, actually, uh, Brian Wolf. Uh, Brian is a sophomore management fellow. He's a residential assistant and an ultimate Frisbee team captain, working on making that more official here at DePaul over time while he's here. But, uh, but extraordinaire, Brian Wolf, please welcome. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Peter Rupert, CEO of Fusion Education Group. With over 20 years of experience in the education industry, Mr. Rupert has led Fusion Education Group to become a leading provider of personalized learning solutions for students of all ages. Peter Rupert is a driven entrepreneur who started his journey in high school, kickstarting six companies that provided him with invaluable learning opportunities and led to his eventual launch of Fusion Education Group in 2007. While at the company, Mr. Rupert has opened over 120 schools and acquired more than 25 others. Today, Fusion operates more than 80 Fusion Academies across 18 states and the District of Columbia. In 2020, the company launched Fusion Global Academy, an international one-to-one -one virtual school that provides 100% live instruction in every class. In addition to his work, Mr. Rupert is the author of a book that may sound familiar to some of you, Limitless, Nine Steps to Launch Your One Extraordinary Life. In this inspiring and motivational book, Mr. Rupert de details his own experience post-graduation and the lessons he learned along the way. Mr. Rupert shares his insights on how to take control of your life and reach your full potential, both personally and professionally. It has received critical acclaim and has become a popular resource for individuals looking to make positive changes in their lives. With that, please welcome our speaker for today, Peter Rupert, class of 86. Am I mic Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or still morning, maybe. I am thrilled to be back on campus 
And what an honor to have a chance to speak to this group. Um, so many great memories from my time here that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and I just hope that this is, uh, in a way, might be helpful to each one of you. As I'm not going to talk as much about some of the successes I've had as also some of the challenges. And, and uh, I think that's what the world is and what life's all about. I'm going to hit on five things today. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how I chose DePaul way back when, my experience in the four years that I was on this campus. I'll talk a little bit about my early career. And then I'll talk about my entree into education almost 25 years ago now, entrepreneurship and the eventual founding and growth of Fusion Education Group. And then finally, I'll close with a little bit about what I learned or maybe what I wish I knew when I was in your seats 40 years ago. So it was spring 1982, long, long time, and I was a senior in high school in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was the third of six kids, and it came down to choose my college. My older brother, four years older than me, at that time was a senior at Denison University, and visiting him, I loved the environment of a small liberal arts school and kind of became very interested in pursuing that path myself. And as I looked at other options, I found DePauw. Ultimately, my decision came down to DePauw or Denison. Well, I know that many of you today are in the Management Fellows Program. The Management Fellows Program had just been started back in 1982. I think I was the third graduating class in that program. And as a young kid look at, interested in entrepreneurship, I had started a lawn mowing business when I was in high school. The Management Fellows Program was really exciting to me, to be in an honors program that was focused on business and still have the power of a liberal arts education. That's what ultimately led my decision to choose DePauw. And I knew, just from my visit here, that opportunities abounded to get involved, to learn about myself, and to carve my own path. And finally, when I was a senior in high school, one of my teachers grabbed me in the hallway, who had, I'd had her as a teacher a couple times when I was younger, and it was the senior week before we graduated, and she grabbed me and said, Pete, whatever happened, what did you decide to do on your college decision? I said, well, Mrs. Pierce, I'm going to DePaul University in Indiana. And she looked at me with these big eyes, and she said, you're kidding me. That's where I went. You will have the greatest time. And I said, well, thank you. I'm so excited. I think it's going to be great, too. So I started to turn with my buddies and walk down the hall, and then she grabbed my arm and said, by the way, Pete, you're going to meet your wife there. Whoa. <laughs> so my friends who were with me, they all kind of, we all kind of rolled our eyes and walked away and said, not a chance. <laughs> so DePauw, four years, everything I expected. Fantastic four years of my life. The small classes the dedicated professors who cared about each and every student and helped in any way they could, the liberal arts courses. I knew that I would spend my life in business, so the chance to be able to take courses in religion and philosophy and psychology and history, I ate those up. And then to be involved in extracurriculars and be involved in finding ways to leverage the experience, to learn how to think, to learn how to communicate, to learn how to lead, nothing more important than those kind of lessons. But as we know, DePaul was a lot more than the academic experience. And sometimes I probably was a little bit focused in what was happening in a place like this than maybe I should have been spending more time in the library. But nonetheless, 40 years later, I still connect with my fraternity brothers from those four years, and it's like we never miss a beat. We still relive the same stories, the same memories, the same fondness for our exposure and experience in our fraternity, as well as DePauw. It's incredible. I'd mentioned I was interested in entrepreneurship. And so after my lawn mowing business, I decided what's next. And hearing some powerful speakers on campus, I decided to try another business. And a friend of mine joined me in launching Duro Seal Blacktopping. And I borrowed $1,300 from my father, bought this 1969 GMC pickup truck you can see in the background, two-wheel drive, not four-wheel drive, barely hanging on, but enough to help a young entrepreneur get started. Bought a big 250-gallon tank to put on top of it, bought our driveway sealer wholesale, 
and went out and knocked on doors at night, at night to try and sell people on letting us do their services. Incredible experience. I did my internship as a management fellow, and I'll talk more about that later. But for those of you who don't know, you probably have Apple Macs and things like that, really cool, slick. This is the original Macintosh computer in 1984. I got a chance to work on it. Hard to believe time has changed that much. Feel really old when I show it to people your age. And then finally, we knew Marvin. So much enjoyed our times at Marvin's that when we graduated, my fraternity pledge class and I ran down there and got this last picture with him. What four years, what an experience. But there were three life-changing experiences that I want to share a little bit of time on that happened in this place called DePauw. Well, as you know, I believe the GPA requirement is still 3.2 to stay as a management fellow in good standing. Is that true? Well, I flirted with that for all four years. Um, and, <laughs> and during the summer between my sophomore and junior year, I got a letter from the management fellow's office. Dear Pete, unfortunately your grades aren't up to snuff. Your, your overall GPA has fallen below 3.2. You are now officially on probation. That's a bummer. But then the next paragraph, they said, not only that, but you have to prove you can get your grades back up. And if you do, you can do an internship your senior year. Oh, how deflating is that? Those of you who have been around DePaul now for a little while know the last thing you want to do your senior year is be off campus doing an internship. So I said, this is a big, sticky dilemma. What do I do? Can't accept this. So I get back to campus that fall, and I go into Rip Tilden's office, the director at the time, and I tell him, Rip, and I plead with him. I said, please, please, please. And to his credit, and a testament to the faculty who work here, Rip said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you appeal this to the management fellows overseers, which was mostly at that time the econ department. Folks like Ralph Gray, very intimidating. So I got to go in and meet with Ralph Gray and three or four others. And after some stern lectures, believe it or not, they gave me a chance. They said, hey, if you get your grades up by midterm, we will let you interview at the end of the semester for a second semester junior year internship. Uh, it was kind of a victory. It was a victory in a way. But I knew there was an entrepreneur by David Moorhead, who eventually became a trustee here and served forever. David was coming to campus, and he was going to offer an internship for the first time second semester of his junior year. That's who I wanted to work for. I didn't want to work for a big company. I wanted to be an entrepreneur, the chance to work for someone like that. But the problem was he was coming in late September. I wasn't eligible to interview until October if my grades got up. So I wrote David a big, long letter explaining my interest in an entrepreneur, the fact that I'd started a driveway ceiling business, et cetera. He read the letter, and he said, I'd like to meet this kid. After he interviewed all the eligible <laughs> students for internships, I met him at the end of that day. We hit it off. And he said, you know what? I'm going to give this kid a chance. I got that opportunity. Assuming my grades got up, luckily I exceeded the benchmark. And I got to go to an internship for an entrepreneur in Dallas, Texas for six months. Life-changing experience, number one. What an experience to work for an entrepreneur directly, see how a business works. So that was number one. Secondly, my future education. So as part of that internship, David Moorhead takes me on a sales call one day to go see one of the company's biggest customers. And he's driving along. I'm sitting in the passenger seat. And he turns to me and he says, hey, Pete, have you ever thought about going to business school? And I kind of looked down and said, no, not really. No one in my family had ever gone to business school. Um, and he says to me, well, if you want to be an entrepreneur, business school might be a great step because you can learn all about business, meet more people, et cetera. And I said, nod in my head. And he turns to me and says, hey, Pete, have you thought about going to Harvard Business School? Because I think you can get in. <laughs> Here I'm, 3-2, barely eligible for my internship having more fun on campus than studying. And this guy's telling me I can go to Harvard Business School. And he then proceeds to talk to me about, hey, you can do this. So I go home that night and I write down my goal to someday be admitted to Harvard Business School. 
I say, I'm going to leverage my senior year. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to get more leadership experiences. I'm going to find a great job out of college. I'm going to crush it for two or three years, and then I'm going to apply. Sure enough, three years later, I go to Harvard Business School. Life-changing event number two, David Moorhead. Changed my life, changed the trajectory, changed the people I met, made such a huge difference, all because of DePauw and this DePauw grad. Third big life-changing event. Remember Mrs. Pierce? <laughs> my wife, Jessica, back here. The mother of our four kids. And I have been married as of this summer 33 years. So kudos to my wife. So that's to Paw. So let's talk about going out of the Paw. I told you I was going to get that job. I was going to do very well. Because of our career center here, I got an opportunity to work for Procter & Gamble. Figured what a great place. I'm preparing to be an entrepreneur someday. Great training. Great management experience at a young age. I go to Harvard Business School. Like I said, I got in. Wow, what a place to go learn how to be a general manager, a CEO, an entrepreneur. Two incredible years. And I graduate from Harvard, and I'm thinking, I don't want to go work for a big company. I don't want to be a work for a big consulting firm or be an investment banker. How can I find a way to work with entrepreneurs? And there's a small business consulting firm in Boston that hires me to give me a chance. Great experience. Six months into that, my boss there comes to me and said, hey, Pete, we can start our own consulting firm. We can do it better. We can make more money. We can be entrepreneurs. So I naively say, Absolutely, I'm in. Jumping in both feet, no idea. We have no capital, we have nothing. But slowly, we turn that first consulting day of billing, $1,250, we reinvest that, we reinvest, constantly reinvest, and eventually we grow. We have two or three offices, We've got a number of consultants who work for us, and we're doing really well. But I was young and naive, I didn't quite understand the best, the key parts about growing a business. And I just thought we'd always have clients growing and growing. Well, a number of clients ended up kind of canceling at the same time, kind of a perfect storm. Our client pipeline of new folks dried up. And all of a sudden, we had a lot of expenses and hardly any revenue and no rainy day fund. And so we had to close the business. So I'm 33 years old. I'm married. My oldest son, Jack, is a baby, and I'm unemployed right when all my friends were starting to crush it in their career. So the best laid plans of this entrepreneur aren't going so well. <laughs> but we learn. So I'm trying to figure out what I do next, and I get this big break. At that time, we were in Chicago in 1997. The charter school movement is just getting started. And there's this entrepreneur who owns several different businesses who had started a company called National Heritage Academies in Michigan. He's looking for a business person to run his educational company. I get to meet him. He ultimately offers the job to be president of this. For the next eight years, we had a tremendous amount of success. We grew from three or four schools at the start to 51 when I left eight years later. We constantly focused on creating a better, more efficient education. But I wanted more. At the end of the day, this was his company. I wanted to be an entrepreneur, or at least a CEO, as president. And so I started to look for other opportunities. A friend of mine comes to me. He owns several different businesses as well. And he says, hey, I have this healthcare company that really needs a lot of work. I'd love for you to come to be CEO. He had been extremely successful, planes, helicopters, houses all over the country. And it was too good to be true, this package he was offering me. What a rude awakening that was from the get-go it doesn't go very well. We don't really hit it off. We have different styles, right, wrong, or indifferent. After a particular argument we had in front of my management team shortly after New Year's in 2006, I decide that this isn't what I want to do. So I resign. Suddenly, my wife doesn't even know this is going to happen. I call, I call home and say, honey, I just quit. So now I'm unemployed with absolutely no plans, no secondary plans. Sometimes I can be that way, um, and she sticks with me. I've got three kids, and then young Ben, who's on the way, and I don't have a job, nor an income. 
So now what? Now I'm 43. I have two choices. I can go find a job and leverage what I have done and be secure and have the income to feed and educate my family, etc. Or I can chase my dream against the odds. Had a number of long conversations with my wife because I'm interviewing. I'm trying to find something. But at the same time, I'm thinking about this opportunity in education. My wife, who is kind of the opposite of me in terms of her ability or willingness to take risk, to her credit, says, you know what, I'm sick of this. Go for it. So we agree that I'll take till the end of 2006 to try and find the money to launch the company. And I've been thinking a lot about education after my six years. You know, if you think about education today, it's still done for all intents and purposes the same way it was 100 years ago. Birthed in the industrial age. If you're 12 years old, what do we do? We put you in sixth grade. You may be learning at the seventh or eighth grade level, but we put you in sixth grade. So inevitably you become bored, frustrated, and possibly revert back to the norm. Not good. But worse yet, if you sh at the fourth or fifth grade learning level, we're still gonna put you in sixth grade. Maybe you'll get an extra service. But those kids get frustrated too and fall further and further behind. And then we ask ourselves as a nation, what's the problem with our high school dropout problem? There had to be a better way. And at the time, you thought about every other industry across the world that was becoming so customized, so personalized, the tennis shoes you wear, the clothes you wear, the restaurants you go, all customized to your needs and what you want but not education. So I made a bet. The bet I made as I was out talking to investors is that the future of education will be all about customization, specialization, and personalization. Whoever gets there first would win. And I would go around to investors and said, what if we could build schools around the needs of kids versus forcing almost every kid through a standard model that works for many, but not for all? I had 11 months to get it done. So over those next 11 months, I would reach out to investment bankers, private equity groups, venture capitalists, anybody who would listen to my story I'd pitch, or really my dream, not much of a story. And all it took was one. Two investors came together at an end to both back me. December of that year, right before our self-imposed deadline. An American education group, which we started out being called, was launched in January. 2007. From humble beginnings, I rented out this small little office, just a couple little office spaces in this state-of-the-art technology-based business. That's a joke. Um, and that's where we started. No revenue, no schools, no employees other than me. But I had learned in my study of successful people during some of the tough times in my earlier career that you had to dream big. And you have to dream big from the beginning. And so in our tiny little office, you walk through our quote unquote front door, and there was a reception desk there, unstaffed at the time. But I went to a Kinko's, and I had them put on a big piece of foam core, our vision and our BHAG. And for those of you who know Jim Collins, BHAG is big, hairy, audacious goal. Now mind you, we had won two or three schools in those early years. And on there, we'd say 100 schools we'd have by 2020, I think the time was. That's dreaming big, because the number of people who would kind of snicker when they saw that when they walked into our tiny little office, or roll their eyes, who is this guy? Kidding. But it rallied us, and it made us always think about what if. Let's shoot for the stars and see what happens. About a year later, we came across the original Fusion Academy campus. Solana Beach, California, a block from the beach in this tiny little strip center. Barely a school, maybe three or 4,000 square feet. But what happened in there was magical. I walked into that school, met the entrepreneur, Michelle Gilman, and saw what she was doing. Every class taught one-to-one, -one, one teacher, one student. Students moving from teacher to teacher throughout the day teachers who can really make a difference and personalize the entire educational journey for the kids. The mentoring and coaching they were able to do in addition to the personalized learning and teaching. Incredible. I said, we have got to have this. So we bought it. And we were on our way. Slowly we started growing. 
and adding more of that model. I'll just pause for a second. This is just a quick minute or so video that will tell you a little bit more about fusion and what we do today. The traditional schools, they're trying to, to educate a mass of people. Fusion is trying to educate individuals. I have a large case of anxiety. I have dyslexia. I was failing every subject. I was bullied a lot. I was super bad ADD. The school that I was at before wasn't really accommodating for me. I would never wanted to try. I could just get away with not reading or not doing the homework. and. That was not very good. I was getting such bad anxiety. I was going down this downward spiral. He was just in a really bad place. I decided this is not working. We were looking for an alternative to the public school system. We came upon Fusion. Stumbled upon Fusion. Found Fusion. Heard about Fusion. We ended up at Fusion because we wanted something that would help her fall back in love with education. It was magical from the very beginning. A whole new world like opened up. One on one is amazing. I didn't want to learn anything at my previous school. The school, I wanted to learn. They made it that way. The information started to click. Fusion has made a big impact on my life. What else does a parent want than to watch their child develop the wings to fly? The thing that he said was, they really like me. And as a parent, sometimes that's all you want. We just had to find the answer. Standard model doesn't work for everybody. And the best part of what we do, despite the business success and the growth, is the fact that we get to impact kids every single day and literally change kids' lives and their future. It's a pretty amazing experience. So back to struggles. You know, it's, it's really exciting to be here today and, and to talk about our successes, but there were challenges. I talked about those two investors to come together for that one yes. Well, a year in, one of the investors, 50% of our funding, bailed. They didn't believe in our strategy, didn't believe in our management, our approach, and ultimately didn't believe in me. So we're scrambling in 2008 trying to find replacement money in order to keep this thing going. 2008, 2009, the recession is big time. Our pitch that the schools we had acquired at that point in time, we would grow them, we would make them better. They were, always going, they were all going backwards financially. And we lost money year after year after year for the first several years. Our investors were losing their patience. But slowly, we started to make progress. We started to replicate that fusion model across the country. And fast forward to today, we're obviously very proud of what we built. From that startup with me as the only employee, no revenue, no schools. Today we have 81 campuses plus our school online. We're servicing kids in 50 states and 33 countries. Almost 12,000 students come through our doors each year. We've grown to have 2,500 amazing employees and unbelievably dedicated teachers. And we've reached the point where we're north of $250 million in annual revenue. The best part is we are so committed in our vision to become the most personalized schools in the world. And what's exciting about today is that we're just touching the surface. Our future is even brighter than where we've been. So what do I do? The entrepreneurship thing was, has been one of the best parts of my life. I wouldn't change it for the world, despite, the, despite some of the challenges along the way. And as I final segment here, talk about what I wish I knew and what I really learned starting at the PAW and share those with you. I put this as number one in my book and I put this as number one here. The most important thing is to believe in yourself and to learn how to self-advocate. I talk about win the battle in your head in my book. That's exactly where it all starts, in between our ears. We all have that negative voice and that positive voice that talk to us, and too often we let the negative voice say, don't take that risk, don't try, you're not good enough. Every single one of us has it. Train your mind to help that best part that says you can do this. You're amazing, come to the fore. Secondly is to dream big and make it bigger, just like that foam core vision statement we put out there. 
Don't dream for the next job. Think about what you want to do in this world, what you want your career, your future, your family, your relationships to look like, and make it bigger. Don't settle. Set goals. I didn't learn this until I was in my 20s. Set goals consistently, and more importantly, write them down, share them with champions or mentors, and post them. Because when you write things down about your goals and what you want to achieve and you are willing to share it, you're starting already down that path. And when you post them so you see them every day, your mind will subconsciously, without you even know it, start to push you toward that. I can't explain the science, but there's some kind of gravitational pull that helps us. Number four, find and surround yourself with champions. I mentioned David Moorhead. I mentioned Rip Tilden. I mentioned all, I didn't mention so many people in my life that helped me along the way. Find those champions, ask them for their help, not just to tell you how great you are, but to hold you accountable for your dreams and your goals. Number five, embrace failure. Too often we're afraid to take that chance. We're afraid to take that step. But if you're not pushing your own envelope, if you're not pushing your own capabilities, you're never gonna fail. That's the comfort zone, that's the bubble. Learn how to fail, learn from it. it is absolutely the most important part of your journey. If you're not failing, you're not pushing yourself, you're not doing your accountability to yourself. Number six, never ever give up. I see time and time again, people get started on chasing a dream, they hit their first obstacle, and they revert back to their comfort bubble. Never ever give up on dreams that are important to you. And then finally, Read, read, read. Your education doesn't stop here. These things that sit in our hands every day, that's not reading. Find ways to read and everything else. Continue your learning journey. And a final thought. You know, we live in a country that is divided at times, we think about how bad things are. You can't pick up your phone. You can't read a paper about hearing all the problems. But I'm going to put a little infomercial out there. You live in a country called the United States of America. And as you think about your future, millions of people would love to be in your spot. Despite our challenges, despite our problems as a nation, this is the one place in the world, no matter who you are, what you start with, you can do whatever you want. Remember that as you chase your own limitless future. It's an incredible place. Take advantage of it. And lastly, be crazy enough to change the world in your own way, whatever that might be. And I'll finish with this short video, a commercial from Apple. It had to be 30, 40 years ago, long before you all were born but still a great message. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. It's been a pleasure being here. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Like I said, it's an honor to have a chance to present to this group. And I wish you all limitless success. Dream big, believe in yourself, and chase limitless. Thanks so much, appreciate it. <clears throat> How many have read the book? Ah, look at that. Ah, yeah. 
I was lucky enough to get a like a, a pre-read copy, the you know, to be able to edit before. So I've got a pre-read version that maybe someday will be worth a lot of money. <laughs> so there'll be a short supply there. Okay, well, what a wonderful and inspiring presentation, Thanks, Peter. Steve. Thank you. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about what it takes to be a recipient, recipient can't even talk, of the uh, Robert C. McDermott Medal for Excellence in Entrepreneurship. And the requirements to be even nominated for this highest award offered by the McDermott Center. Today, Peter will join previous prestigious honorees that include Dan Hassler, David Becker, Judson Green, Alan Hubbard, Jan Rissey, Rissey, Jeffrey Harmoning, Angie Hicks, Thomas Cooper, last year Megan Casey Glover, and Justin Christian, just to name a few. <laughs> what a group. To receive this honor, the recipient must have demonstrated the following attributes. The individual has been instrumental in the formation or growth of an entrepreneurial business venture in a small or large organization. They have demonstrated a long record of excellence in leadership and management, as well as actively assisting others in establishing entrepreneurial businesses and initiatives. Recipients, re recipients, there we go, have a proven history of unique displays of creativity and innovation in entrepreneurial leadership or entrepreneurial behavior within a larger organization. And the individual is either a DePaul alum, a friend or supporter of DePaul, or a gracious supporter of the state of Indiana. As we've heard today, and anyone who's ever met Peter, can witness that today's recipient is a living testimony of these attributes. So let's give him one more applause there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And I also appreciate that he shared today some of the bumps along the journey. And I think the, the fortitude of DePaul is that the bumps really do become really springboards. And I know that as you each pursue your careers and there will be bumps, there will be turns, but the fortitude of what you gain here in these four years, he demonstrated. Was it easy? No. Jennifer, wonderful <laughs> that, you, that you gave him that chance to December. You know, that she, she has that DePaul, that DePaul ethic in her too, let's give it a shot. I know we've got a baby on the way in three, but we're gonna do this thing, you know? That's what DePaul uh, fortitude is all about. So, now I would like to present Dr. Lori White, 21st President of DePaul University, to award Peter Rupert, Rupert 1986, with the McDermott Medal for Excellence and Entrepreneurship. Peter, thank you so much for those inspiring words, and you delivered a message that I know that I really needed to hear today. And thank you also for the work that you do in education. One of the things that was not provided in his bio is he's a new member of the Board of Trustees. And yes. And so students, knowing that you have someone on the board, really everyone on the board, but Peter in particular, who is such a strong advocate for the education of young people, um, lets us know that DePauw is in great hands. So now I have the pleasure of formally presenting you with the medal. So Peter Rupert, having demonstrated a lifetime of entrepreneurship, creativity, and innovation, demonstrating impeccable leadership skills and managing organizations of all sizes, sharing your knowledge and experience with others through your book, Limitless, hosting countless DePaul student interns at Fusion Education Group, and giving back to your community by co-founding Armed Forces Thanksgiving to honor military veterans in West Michigan it is my pleasure to award you Peter Rupert with the Robert C. McDermott Medal for Excellence in Entrepreneurship. Well, I, uh, 
face the audience, I get to put the medal on you. I love it. Which is great because, you know, he's so much taller than I am, <laughs> right? And I'll also give you this. Thank so, you so congratulations. much. Congratulations. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I wanted Je I said Jennifer, Jessica, or Jessica and your two sons, could you come up for a picture before official photographer here with Dr. White too. <laughs> We're gonna put you on the spot. <sighs> Peter does share his contact information with you. Uh, he'll be available for a very short time afterward then he's gotta get on with his schedule but he is willing to answer questions. He also, as you're exiting today, has a uh, what is it that? A little laminated Lam sheet. There you go. Laminated sheet of inspiration. inspiration. Things to follow. If you've read his book, it'll be very familiar. But feel free to pick one of those up uh, at the end of the table as you're heading out. And it'll be something you can put up on your wall in your room and uh, keep with you for a long time. I encourage you, if you haven't read the book, grab it read it, and then you've got uh, the opportunity to reach out to the author and share. So thank you again. Thank you to all who came. Thank you to our alumni uh, and Zaida Banasi for organizing all of that. Clay for making sure we have this uh, recorded and everything went smooth. Thank you, alumni base. We're very thrilled to have Peter and his family here today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Awesome Appreciate work. it. Awesome. Oh, my pleasure.